welcome everybody and uh, special, especially welcome to uh, today's speaker, John Bristow. Uh, John completed his BSc and MSc in geology at the University of Natal in 1976. He then did a PhD in geochemistry at the University of Cape Town in 1981. And uh, his subject was the geology and origin of the Karoo volcanics preserved in the Lebombo monocline on the eastern margin of South Africa. After that, he spent two years undertaking postdoctoral studies on volcanic deposits and processes in the Western USA at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Uh, he subsequently pursued a successful career in local and international minerals exploration and mining and he worked primarily in the diamond sector. Uh, he was initially working with De Beers and then he started his own business and various other mining ventures, um, which obviously have given him a tremendous amount of experience in all aspects of the subject. Uh, John currently resides in uh, Hamanas, which I can uh, testify from personal experience is a fabulous little place. Uh, in, in, on the, near the south coast of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, he, he lives there with his wife, Marilyn, who's uh, also attending this lecture. Hello, Marilyn. Marilyn uh, accorded um, me and uh, my colleagues uh, some wonderful hospitality when we visited recently. Thank you again for that, Marilyn. Uh, John coordinates the Overberg Geoscientists Group, which has just got an absolutely tremendous, it must be world leading, um, uh, lecture program, um, which has been uh, just fantastic for people during COVID lockdown, keeping everybody um, uh, everybody uh, connected and working in geology. And um, as you might expect, it's uh, such a huge effort and a wonderful lecture program supported by field trips has resulted in a very big and enthusiastic uh, membership. So, um, the Overberg Group in particular um, is interested in taking geology to the people, outreach as we call it here, in particularly young scientists. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce John's talk um, tonight. Uh, and uh, the title is Experiences of a Geologist in India. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Gillian. Um, and um, really appreciate um, the organization of this presentation and it's nice to meet um, some of the people that we've heard about from NEGS which are I guess mostly both in the UK and elsewhere. So not, not to waste any more time, I, I've, I've had a wonderful ex um, career in the diamond space. I've also worked in, as Gideon said, Karoo Basalts and large igneous provinces which was also fun. I was fortunate enough to do my PhD in the Kruger National Park. And one of these days when Julian and her group come back, we aim to go and visit that. But let's let's get on to India. So I'm going to give you a, 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 hopefully a sort of fairly lighthearted um, overview of my experiences in India. It's, a, it's an amazing place. Um, it's where the diamond business started about 2000 years ago. And, and, as, and we'll focus a bit on that tonight, but um, We'll also focus on other aspects of, of India as well. And um, I, I, you, you will also get some images of Marilyn along the way. We had a wonderful trip there to an Indian wedding in 2005, which was an experience of a lifetime. Anyway, th th and this picture is um, somewhat um, interesting. It's a picture of our SAA flight that we took to India out of Johannesburg. It was a, back then, it was a really easy eight-hour flight to Mumbai, and um, it, it was a, an enjoyable daytime flight, and you could see lots of the coastal scenery of parts of Africa in the early stages of the flight, and then you'd get over to India. Sadly, given um, some of our more recent experiences of corruption and um, uh, misdeeds of presidents, um, this flight was, um, or this um, South African Airways flight to India was canned courtesy of, um, of a corruption process, but we won't go into that tonight. So um, let's get on with it. So, so there's on the left, the presentation structure. I'll keep more or less to that. Um, I'll remind you where we are along the way. Just in terms of 
country statistics. Most of you people, I'm sure, will be, or most people will be aware of this um, population of India, about 1.4 billion people. Um, one of the countries that, unlike China, and China is decreasing or flattening its population, you know, India is still on the increase. Um, a lot of that population, 35% are urban dwellers. Um, it makes up about 18% of total world population, and the median age is, is about 28, 29 years. The one very distinct feature of Indian people, um, they have a very, or generally young population. They are all well-educated and, and very ambitious and hardworking. And we'll see that um, come out in the discussion in the course of the evening. Down below, um, the reason I started going to India um, is it's the center of, um, of the diamond manufacturing business. About 92, 95% of all the world's diamonds from wherever they are mined end up being effectively purchased by um, Indian family businesses and then cut and polished um, to a very high quality, right down to extremely small sizes. So the picture we're looking at here is the factory is a factory in Mumbai. Those are cut and polished goods of what we call smalls and melee, less than 0.2 of a carat or 20 pointers. And if you were to look at the, the quality of those cuts down a microscope, they are absolutely superb for such tiny um, pieces of, of diamond. And then just a little quirk of India. I'm sure some of you have been there, but when it comes to their numerics, they have some interesting um, counting systems um, one lakh just for interest we won't really go into into it tonight is a hundred thousand and one crore is 10 million so when they get to big numbers they tend to you know revert and, and refer to lakhs and crores um but this evening i'll take you we'll go to mumbai we'll then go up to to delhi agra um, where the amazing um uh, monument to Babo's wife is to the, the uh, Taj Mahal, um, go down to Jaipur or, or the pink city, and then we'll go and look from a diamond aspect at the Krishna River in Hyderabad. The Krishna River is where it, all of or most of, of India's big diamonds came from going back 2,000 years. Then we'll look at the little Panal mine, a Kimberla called Bunda, which was discovered by Rio Tinto in the early 90s. It'll probably never be developed, developed because of, of bureaucracy. And then we'll go to Riper where we worked on a, on a diamond exploration project and then back to Mumbai. Okay, so gateway to India. Many of you on the right, the picture on the right, many of you will have seen that. It's very famous from the point of view of people landing in India and obviously particularly Mumbai. And they have um, these rather fun um, sort of transport ferries that run around the coastline um, adjacent to, to Mumbai water transport. Just a bit of history, and, and this, um, this is a very um, busy table, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but um, um, the, the, the history of India is fascinating. Obviously, it's um, stuck up against the rest of Asia. Um, an awful lot of our, our sort of world history um, started in, in Asia, and um, I've also sent this presentation to Gillian and John, and I think Christine, you're more than welcome to to have it. You can pass it around, Gillian, and people that, if they're interested can you know brush up on on this later. Anyway, it's a fascinating there's a fascinating history of um, of um, different cultures, the development of of early India, and it's. Um, Settlement, particularly in the in the Indus Valley, Indus Va River Valley, is is fascinating. We'll look at some pictures of that, and then it goes through many 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 stages of development, um, wars, um, destruction of empires, and rebuilding of empires. Um, quite interesting in this medi medieval period, we have the Gupta Empire. Um, the Gupta um, name has been synonymous with some of our big. Um, challenges and, and corruption issues we've had in this country. So it's not a particularly um, popular name in South Africa, but anyway, it features quite prominently in the, in the early sort of middle history of, of India. 
Um, in, in 1498, Vasco da Gama um, discovered a new sea route from Europe to India, and that really um, began the focus of, um, of um, Europeans and, and the Brits um, going across to India um, to look for spices and all sorts of precious stones. And in the process, of course, um, that led to the discovery of or, or the, the the landing at Cape Town along the way. And so, some of our Southern African or South African history is also linked into that. The British um, earliest um, landings in India was the, East, the English um, East India Company in 1608, and and following in that was, of course, that the period of the Raj, which took place from about. Um, 1858 and 1947 and there's some fascinating history in there and then we'll we'll finish off with the partition of India in 1947. Okay but um, th th that's really all I'm going to do but fascinating country, fascinating history. A bit on the religions, languages, the caste system, many of your people will know about the caste system. It, it's, it's kind of sort of fading but um, but um, certainly when I worked there, it was still quite prominent. And I'll never forget my first um, trip to India, land at Mumbai, and amongst this sort of mob of people, and you feel absolutely lost. And then we drove into, into the hotel that we were staying in in Mumbai. And at that stage, um, they have a, a modern highway system development on the go. But on that trip, um, you go down this um, sort of double lane road. It's it's two sections of double lane, and there's a, a sewerage canal down the middle, and you have um, a, a family of caste um, people who are sort of bottom of the bottom, and typically it would be wife, um, husband, and and two, and a couple of little kids who actually live on the side of that. And they, they and similar people, every couple of kilometers, you'd see them effectively living on the side of this open sewer, cleaning the sewer. And, and that's, you know, that's the life that they were almost born into. Um, the, the, the different, um, the different um, sort of groups would be Jainism. Um, that, that the Jains are very strong, and you'll see a lot of the Jain population, um, 2 to 7%, the blue color, um, live or, or from the west side of India, and that's really where the diamond business is, um, either Mumbai or, or Surat, the Sikhs, um, Buddhism, Christianity. So those are the main religions. Um, and that um, table in the middle, lower, you know, shows Hindu, Hindu obviously the biggest um, religion, Muslims, 14% um, Christians, quite big, mostly at the south of India, um, lots of lots of Catholics, and then you get the smaller groups, Buddhist Jains and others. Languages, 122 major, we, you know, we thought we had a problem here in South Africa with nine official languages, well, there's 122 there, and many other local languages, the most spoken are Hindi, English, and Bengali, and then there's a bit there on, on the caste system. Um, the geology is not unlike um, most of the Gondwana continents, um, and you'll see this um, picture there on the on the bottom left-hand side. Um, effectively, <laughs> effectively, you could be you know in parts of the Karpal Kerton here in southern Africa, where you have you have cratons, these ancient cratons, and then you have um, rift valleys between them. And then, of course, for the people interested in large igneous provinces, you have this very extensive Dakan traps uh, with an age of about 65, 66 million years. And that's also quite famous for, for the extinction of, of the dinosaurs. Um, and then across on the right hand side of that diagram, you'll just see India as it was previously plugged into um, into the supercontinent Gondwana land, and obviously subsequent to to this map on the right hand side, that whole you know that Gondwana structure has, has broken up. So the early breakup of Gondwana was about 180 million years. The rocks I worked on in, in the Kruger National Park, the Karoo Volcanics of South Africa, um, and India at that stage moved off with East Antarctica and Australia. 
And then at 130 million years, we had the breakup of or South America pulled away from Africa. So West Gondwana land. And then India uh, went skating off into, into Asia. Um, just looking at India today, it, it's, um, it, it um, has moved at a very rapid rate, um, bulldozing into Asia at something like 9 to 16 centimeters per year. Um, and it's um, done that in, in 80, 80 million years or so. So, so it's, um, and, and I think we have a number of geophysicists on the program tonight, um, you know, including Bruce and Gillian as well. Um, and they might have something to say about the, the consequences of this very fast move of, of India into Asia. And the, and the picture in the, in the middle there shows effectively um, what's happening or happened to, to um, India and why the Himalaya mountains have formed in the process. So on, from the left-hand side, you have the big Ganges plain, and, and that's really the northern part of India. Um, the, the water and um, drainage coming off the Himalayas has carried an enormous amount of silt and sediment down into that um, depression. Um, and it's part of the reason um, for the early population of India was this very fertile Ganges plain. And on the other side, you've got the Asian plate um, there um, expressed as the Tibetan plateau pushing pushing um, into, into India effectively and forming the Himalayas. There's a little cartoon on the right, which again shows India in an overall plate tectonic setting. Um, very interestingly, depending who you read, Everest is supposedly rising still today. Um, some of the figures make it as high as 50 odd millimeters per year. Um, others suggest it's lower than that. But um, you know, technically, um, if, you, if you sort of work on that basis, no climber is yet to reach the top of the world's highest mountain. So just bear that in mind if you're going to climb the, the Himalayas and expect to conquer the world's highest peak. A bit about the, the geography. This is um, um, a slide, a simplified slide on the left of sort of the, the geography and topography of India. Um, like South Africa, you, you have a, a plateau, the Deccan Plateau. It's not quite as high as our 1500 meter um, high Phelps and much higher the Sutu Mountains with their basalts. But it nevertheless is, 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 does have mountains and higher areas in, in the center of the country. And then you have this tremendous Indus Ganges um, valley up, up here in the, you can see my, my cursor in the northern part of um, India against the Himalayas. And of course, that um, big basin also stretched down, stretches down through, through Pakistan. And, and it was really this plain, this very fertile ground up in the north that um, created um, the vegetation farming areas um, for initially in nomadic people and their, their cattle um, to live, live and expand. And, and that really led, led to the early development of, of India. And very interestingly, if you look at the night shot, a satellite photograph of India at night, you'll see where most of the, the big civilization or population density of is um, New Delhi, of course, um, a huge city, sprawling city. Most of you will be aware of the problems with the smog um and pollution and then you get um Lucknow and and then you come down to Kolkata or what used to be Calcutta. Across on the other side you'll have Mumbai, Ahmedabad, um, Hyderabad, and then the other cities um, down south. So just to see where the concentration of, of of Indian people is and that goes way back to to the settlements on that Indus Ganji plain. Okay, let's move on to, to some of the, the main cities. Um, in Delhi is, is the capital of India. It's a fascinating city, lots of um, old, um, old history. Um, and at the same time, it's also a relatively modern, modern city, but um, like um, all cities in India, the, the, the people pressure is enormous and um, the, the problems of, of pollution, 
smoke um, and just too many people becoming more and more challenging. Um, when you look back at the history of, of Delhi, it's been captured, ransacked and rebuilt several times, particularly again during the medieval period. Um, today, it's, it's effectively a dominant trading and commercial center for northern India and has been for centuries. Um, so, so you'll see there post-1990s, note for international finance and corporate networks. Um, so having said that, Mumbai is really still the economic um, sort of hub of India um, and probably to a lesser extent, Calcutta. Um, you have these wonderful big um, arches and historical buildings. Um, the one great thing about India, unlike us, or unlike Africa, the Indians take great pride in all these old buildings. And there's a tremendous amount of ongoing restoration of any old building. Um, and, and again, the craftsmanship is quite amazing. A lot of this orange sandstone, um, yellow sandstone, orange sandstone, comes from Proterozoic sediments about 1,000, um, 1,200 million years old in Northeast India, India up in Uttar Pradesh. And they have massive quarries where a lot of the rock for these buildings has, has come from. Um, and as I said, you know, these ancient artifacts, and here's a very good example, um, an engineering mark, masterpiece, um, I won't, protect, I won't pretend to pronounce the name, this Kut um, tall, tall tower, all built by hand. Um, you can see modern maintenance and repair on the go. Um, but if you look at the precision and bearing in mind back in the days when these um, monuments and, and amazing buildings were built, there was no um, modern laser measuring system. There was no GPS. Um, the um, you know there were mo no theodolites, um, but there you know India you'll see invented mathematics, so there were really good mathematicians and engineers and artisans who shaped and built um, these buildings. And and as I said, the critical or the, or the fascinating thing for me is the um, the fact that they've all been so well maintained and they are continually being maintained. Okay, this this was probably the highlight of the trip um, that Marilyn and I had to well attend a wedding and then go to the Taj Mahal in 2005. It, it really is an exquisite ivory mar white marble mausoleum on the south bank of the Yamana River in the city of Agra. It was commissioned in 1632 AD by the emperor Shah Jahan to house the to tomb of his favorite wife, uh, Mintam Mahal. And it was completed in 1848 and um, also houses his tomb today of Shah Jahan. And some of the, the sort of add ons um, took place a, a few years later. Um, the symmetry of these structures, um, these towers actually lean slightly outward. Um, if you look carefully, you might see that um, on this um, right-hand tower. Um, the reason being, if there was an earthquake or, or a problem, that the tower would fall outside and not, de not destroy the actual mausoleum in the center. Um, the building material, brick and lime mortar, veneered with red, stone, red sandstone and marble. And the inlay work is absolutely priceless. Um, and, you know, by many, and I think, you know, we would agree with that, considered to be the greatest architectural achievement in the entire range of the Indo-Islamic um, period and, and architecture. Um, so this, this is um, the Taj Mahal. Very interesting, too, that the government, this is, uh, and there was a su Supreme Court ruling in 1996 have declared an exclusion zone around the Taj Mahal to protect the monument from pollution. And so they have a what they call the Taj trapezium zone. Um, in that area, you can no longer burn coke or use or coal, um, equally wood. And the, the intention was to protect um, something like 40 protected monuments, including three World Heritage Sites, the Taj Mahal, the Agra Fort, and the Fate Per Sikri which is a, a, another um, mausoleum. The, 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 these um, 
artwork or the decor that Marin's looking at is all made of the most amazing inlays. The 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 the, the section around this um, mural is all inlaid precious stone, and and if you look at it, the finish is absolutely perfect. Um, and this this sort of craftsmanship carries on today. So this is sort of the commercial aspect of the craftsmanship so you can buy a tabletop which is again that same white marble with these precious stone inlays you can buy everything from a very small one to a, a large one you can buy smaller items like these bowls and you'll see you know the workmanship um, going on still using the traditional methods with that were used back in the days the 1600s when the Taj Mahal was built Okay, from from Jaipur, let's skip. Uh, sorry, not Jaipur. From uh, Agra or the Taj Mahal, let's skip across to to the Pink City. It, it's a fascinating place. It's the capital and the largest city in the state of Rajasthan on on the northwest side of India. It was founded in 1727. 1727. It was one of the earliest planned cities of modern India. It was painted pink by the ruler Sawi. Ram Singh the first to welcome His Royal Highness um, Albert Edward Prince of Wales in 1876, who subsequently became King Edward the Seventh and Emperor of, Emperor of India. It also it, it's a city built um, sort of down in a big basin, and there, there are mountains all around it, and it has a wonderful series of forts and walls. You can see this picture on the top right of um, portion of the wall that surrounds the city. Everything is pink, um, so you can buy a pinky, pinky sari and um, just about anything else pink that you want. It's also the home, home, international home of colored gemstones. So we haven't got to diamonds yet, but it's the home of, of, of colored gemstones. Um, which much like diamonds tend to be um, bought up and and taken to this um, international center for cutting or, or manufacturing precious stones those precious stones or semi-precious stones will be amethyst carnelian emerald ruby tanzanite garnets lapis lazuli sapphire topaz and many more and 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 part of the reason again for this is gets back to to the quality of workmanship that these indian artisans um, to in terms of polish, polishing these stones, cutting out the inclusion, inclusions, optimizing the amount of pure, precious um, stone that they can squeeze out a bit of of, um, of larger specimens. Um, this this um, just a series of pictures again. Um, on, on the right top hand side here is again a, a cutting and polishing room. Um, of these people and you can see again the detail and the cleanliness that they they ascribe to um, these two guys at the end will be well seasoned and experienced um, um, sort of supervisors and the guys here on the benches will be the people cutting and polishing and, and remember here too the rocks or the or the specimens you're dealing with are much softer than diamond so there's quite an art to to polishing without grounding grounding away the that you know the facets that you want to to put on each of these stones. And then of course you have the viewing and sales room, and it's always fascinating. Um, I think most of us, you know, who know Indian people or have been there, realize that Indians are great um, salesmen excuse me, or sales ladies, and so you go into these really wonderfully adorned rooms as an example here in the pink room down on the bottom right hand side you'll be um, given lots of lots of indian tea and um, sweet cakes and then you you start your negotiation and bear in mind here that you know here you'll have international um, gemstone buyers coming from all over the world to buy um, in bulk um, to take back to you know, sell in their shops or distribute in America, in the UK, Middle East, and, and wherever else um, precious stones are being sold. Okay, let's um, let's carry on. So we've been up to 
to the northern part of India, New Delhi, we went across to Agra, Agra which is where the Taj Mahal is, and we've done Jaipur. Um, what we're going to do now is start looking more seriously at the diamond space. So we're going to flip down to the Krishna River in um, Southeast India, in the state of, of Andhra Pradesh. There's Mumbai on the far, far left-hand side where we landed. And so we're going to skip down to this fascinating Krishna River, um, look at the Golconda Fort, go look at the Panar Diamond Mine, and then go to Raipur and then back to Mumbai. Okay, so as I said, Indian the Indian diamond business started 2,000 years ago, and um, 92 or 95 percent of India of the world's diamonds go to India. Um, last year, we mined about 130 million carats of, of diamonds. A carat is 0.2 of a gram, and and a, a very large proportion of those diamonds go to to India for manufacturing. From there, um, the, the, the sort of distribution points will be to, obviously Europe is still an important place for selling diamonds and places like Antwerp are still an area for, for trading some rough and some and polished goods, but much smaller than it used to be. And then the, the States, America is still the world's largest retail um seller and and distributor of of diamonds um, um america accounts for about 40 percent of the polished goods but new york is also um, famous um, for cutting and polishing or, or final polishing of big stones and when i talk about big stones i'm talking you know 30 50 100 carats um, stones um, in the polished um, Anyway, let's let's go back to to the Krishna River. Um, top left side there is just lots of small diamonds cut and polished by the Indians. On the right hand side is a an old schematic of of a so called diamond mine. Um, this one is probably a portion of a low grade kimberlite with all these um, sort of um, rather stylistic um, historical workings, and it looks to have been a a fairly vertical structure. Um, but if we go and look at this map, you'll see here, and just focus on, on the Krishna River, um, which is a big river. It's not, not unlike our, our Val and Orange River system here in, in South Africa. It flows for a very long distance from the mountains or, or highlands of India in the West. You see all those yellow dots. A lot of those are are uh, alluvial deposits, and it ends up um, going out into into the Bay of Bengal, um, and and this Krishna River um, has produced most of India's very large diamonds. And when I say very large, there's a list here on the right hand side or lower right hand side, um, starting with the Great Mogul. This was a in the rough that the the figures in the brackets are. Are the rough size of the, the original diamond, 787 carats. That big um, diamond was cut into the Great Mogul, 280 carats, the Orloff, 189, and also the very famous Kornor, which is also part of the Crown Jewels in the UK, at, at 108 carats. And you'll see um, all of these uh, big stones are plus 100 carats, and then there's a, a, a number of 41 carats and bigger. Um, so, so the first indications of diamonds in India was back in, in sort of 400 um, years BC. Um, and the early reference to those diamonds is a, is a Sanskrit manuscript, um, you know, the, the written language and written culture it goes back an awful long way in, in India. Um, and interesting, this was called the lesson of profit, and that makes re reference to diamonds. In the year 327 BC, Alexander the Great um, invaded India and returned to Europe with diamonds from the region. Um, in in, a, in um, subsequent times, there was a Greek sailor who also observed um, what he called alluvions, alluvial deposits adjacent to rivers in India. And that's the earliest reference to diamond mining in European history. And in 1074, the Queen of Hungary had her crown decorated with diamonds. And subsequent to that, 
interestingly, diamonds were then used in, in jewelry. Um, so looking at this map, um, the, the, the early years of diamond mining um, was all around the, the, mostly the alluvial deposits of the Krishna River. And then there were some very low grade kimberlites um, in, you see where that arrow is pointing, actually, there were, were low grade kimberlite pipes and one or two of them were mined by these old timers. Hyderabad, we'll, we'll look at um, the Golconda Fort, that was a, a very important uh, mogul trading center for diamonds. Um, this Wajarakur were low-grade kimberlites, but much like South Africa and Angola, Lesotho, um, many of these low-grade kimberlites are, are never economic enough to mine, but they do produce um, some exceptional large stones. Um, and then there were other odd localities in southern India that produced diamonds. Um, the Panar mine is a small lamprite, um, uh, much like a kimberlite pipe that's produced uh, a sort of handful of diamonds, almost a bucket and spade operation for many, many years. Um, and then, and, and it was mined by um, NMDC, the National Minerals Development Company of India, who owned the, the panel mine, but you'll see there's 78,000 carats in the year 2005, a very small production. So, so that gives you some background on, on where diamond mining has taken place in India historically. Ironically, you know, if you think of it, India is the biggest manufacturer of diamonds but it only really has this one tiny little diamond mine producing diamonds. So the Indians are not particularly good miners, but they're wonderful you know, artisans when it comes to manufacturing and trading diamonds. Riper's Ring, because we'll go and have a look at that. That's where we, um, an Australian company, um, and I, together with a colleague here in South Africa, did some work and provided services to to that company and we spent some really fun times in India exploring all diamonds in this um, area around Riper and we actually found some kimberlite. Okay, just, just give you a few um, bits and pieces background. So the, the, the Krishna River originates, as I said, on highlands, the Western Ghats near Mabaleshwa. Um, in the state of Maharashtra, which is the same state that um, Mumbai is in. So again, this river, like our Orange River in South Africa, sort of flows a long distance across the country. And in that um, flow regime, if you do pick up, um, you know, diamonds along the way, those diamonds have become attritioned in the rivers and the river action. And due to that, the, the very poor quality diamonds are milled out of the system or removed, and it's the big gemstones that, um, that survive. That river is about 1,400 kilometers um, from source to sea. Very interesting, the Arval is 1,120 kilometers, and the Orange River from its source, source in the Sutu all the way to the Orange River mouth at Port Nolith on the Namibian borders, 2,200 kilometers. Um, this um, sort of river basin is also very important from a point of view of arable land. 76% um, of that basin is under cultivation. We, we did some work on the Krishna River and it was fascinating to walk this large river and see how much um, um, crop growing rice, um, corn, um, nuts, um, and and it's worked, worked continuously 365 days of the year. It also has 13 very 13 large hydroelectric dam schemes along the river, not unlike our, you know, the situation with our big dams down the Val and Orange River, the Kharip um, Dam, and then the new dams that are being built up in the Sutu. This is stale, um, a, a sort of sketch from the uh, Valley of Diamonds from the tales of Sinbad the Sailor and the Arabian Nights, um, 18th century Persian book. Some of you I'm sure have read it, showing the serpents in these um, alluvial deposits and old mines that looked after or preserved the diamonds and made it quite difficult to extract. And then this is a more, this was a more modern diamond mine, alluvial diamond mine on the Krishna River in 1885. Um, very, very near to to a town 
um, a modern town on on the on the uh, Krishna River. We we actually walked uh, a lot of this area where this original little mine would be. Um, we couldn't really find any of the, of the relics, but we did find pieces of gravel and um, remnants of of the clasps or rounded boulders that would have been worked at that mine back in 1885, 1900. The Golconda Fort, fascinating building again. Um, it's um, Golconda in Telugu, the local language means Shepherd's Hill, the fortified citadel, and the early capital city of um, Kutba Shah dynasty in 1512 to 1687 and and it, it's mostly fallen down but the buildings that do survive and the and the manner in which they were built was fascinating um it it became an important trading center as it says here because of the vicinity of the krishna river diamond mines especially the kalua mine which is a famous one um, Golconda flourished as a trade center for the large and famous called Golconda diamonds and and some of those big diamonds that I referred to in in the previous slide came from here. There's there's a very interesting diamond. It's the Daria Noor in the Iranian crown jewels, and a, a very crudely fashioned rectangular cut um, sort of a blue white diamond. Fascinating. So that was the group of us visiting um, Golconda Fort next to outside Hyderabad. This is um, Dr. Babu a well-known and quite famous Indian um, geologist who specialized in diamonds, Mike Scott, um, founder of MSA um, here in South Africa, um, who was part of, he and I were sort of offering or, or providing service to the Indians and, and Australian company. Mark, Mark Small, a lovely New Zealander who worked with us and did a lot of the field work. He sadly died of cancer some years ago. Okay, if we go to, to Majgawan, um, this is the, the small um, intrusive diamond pipe, um, an age of 1,042 million years. It's about the same age as our premier diamond mine and other kimberlites that we find in this country. Um, it's, its size is very small. Its grade is also rather low. So it's, it's probably at best sub-economic, maybe economic, the diamond diamonds that come out of here are not bad. It's an olivine lamprite, just for the, the pundits. Um, we in South Africa typically have what we call group one kimberlites, and we also have micaceous kimberlites, which would be similar or equivalent to the olivine lamprites. The lamprite terminology comes, comes out, of, out of Australia. This is a piece of that rock, and you'll see the brownish shows, brown colors caused by the, the brown um red um, flogger pipe mica and just a little cartoon on the right hand side if you can see it this is a, a model of kimberlite or lamprite pipes they old ancient volcanoes they, those that carry diamonds to the surface would have started their journey from the mantle at about 150 kilometers plus uh, which is equivalent to 50 kilobars down below us Diamonds form in the diamond stability field um, at greater than 50 kilobars and 1200 degrees centigrade. And then these, these ancient pipes or volcanoes are just the passenger trains that bring diamonds from down below in the Earth's um, mantle to the surface. And you can see here just um, a, a schematic showing a kimberlite pipe with lots of glittering diamonds in it and obviously it's been prospected and it's about to be mined and interestingly around around this pipe given at least you know 1200 or 2000 or, or, or a thousand years of of erosion there's a very interesting conglomerate it's, it's a very hard um, silicified conglomerate and it's worked mostly by women um, and mines to to recover diamonds so these alluvial deposits are associated with the panel lamprite the situation applies in many kimberlites and and lamprites or the argyle diamond mine in australia 
um, also a 1200 million year old lamparite. It was, was the world's richest diamond mine at one, or, or um, not richest, but um, biggest producer of diamonds from one mine, 40 million carats per annum. Um, you find a very similar situation. And these women dig away at this. It, it's a very solidified, very hard. They dig away at it. So they, they, they use old, and I don't have a picture here, old gas cylinders, which they cut sort of cut in half and, and a piece of old axle or metal to, to basically bash up and, and grind these um, pieces of, of hard um, gravel with diamonds sitting in them. And then they wash that material in in a um, pothole like the, like you can see here, and you it's um, you use that basket or particularly a flat basket um, with with a sieve through the bottom, and you jig that and in in that jigging action you you once you get experience at it your heavy minerals including diamond or ilmenite or anything else that's heavy concentrates in the middle. And it's that um, middle section that you would then, you know, look for, or the course, or, or the, the heavy concentrate, including diamond, and pick them up by hand. Okay, this is um, the riper area. This is now going down um, further south of, of Pana. I think um, I did show you a, a, a map here. Yeah, so we, we've we just been looking at, at Pana and the alluvial deposits around Pana. See that the gemstones out of there, never really that big. I think the largest recorded diamond is about 30 carats um, compared to the very large diamonds that have come out of the, the Krishna River. Anyway, from there, we just um, dropped down to, to Raipa and we're going to look at some of the prospecting activities that we conducted there. So, so back in in the early two thousands, the Indians put out. Um, I think there were ten blocks of ground which had an indication of of diamonds um, having been recovered from within the blocks in the past. Um, a consortium made up of an Indian diamantier group, um, Barrett Shaw and Company, or, or um, yeah, Barrett Shaw and Company, and an Australian junior, um, basically got together and um, put in a bid for block seven. This, we, we, a couple of us, um, including Mike Scott and myself, had looked at these blocks and given them some advice. This one looked to be the most prospective. It actually had a number of known Kimberlites. This here, Beridi, Kodamali, Jangra, and Palikant. Um, these four Kimberlites were known, and we were quite confident that we'd find more so, so they made a bid for this. They were successful, and um, over the next couple of years, um, we worked on exploring this block and looking for kimberlites. And we did find um, a number of kimberlites. Almost certainly, this Beridi um, should have been a small mine. There was another kimberlite we found north of that that probably could have added to that. Not big, but certainly positive in terms of having diamonds and, and reasonable diamonds. Unfortunately, this, prog this program and project got killed by politics and, and the bureaucracy, which if we think is bad in South Africa, it's, it's even worse there. Um, this um, area was originally part of the very large, big central state of Madhya Pradesh. And Madhya Pradesh um, became, or it's, along the way, it's been split up into a couple of, or three states, I think. And this area became known as Chattisgarh. And when this um, split was made, you had a whole new bureaucracy set up for um, Chattisgarh, um, a new um, minister of the state. And he was quite a... a um, tough guy and somewhat corrupt and he he effectively um, for various reasons almost put a stop to this project so we we eventually and and the Indian Diamantier in spite of all his efforts to you know keep the business going and keep the exploration going um, you eventually had to walk away so this this project still sits out there anyway so we we um, had an exploration program we worked in um, that this this white area here is a big um, elevated block of sandstone, <clears throat> very pretty, 
part of the world that also has um, a tiger reserve in in the area as well. <clears throat> we obviously weren't allowed to work on that um, tiger reserve, but we worked all around it. And you'll see on the top right hand side, excuse me, uh, Mark Small with some of the uh, Indian geologists um, collecting samples in the field. Well, in this case, in the forest, but this wasn't in the forest where the tigers were. And this um, plant, this jig plant or plight jig plant, um, was was constructed um, to test kimberlite samples, and we did do some testing. Very interestingly, this this plant was copied here in South Africa, as I've said, and made in India. Um, along the way, we brought out a very decent and a very smart Indian engineer who did steel fabrication and he came out and looked at um, how we make them in South Africa he went back to India and in about six months he manufactured or they manufactured this plant um, plant from beginning to end probably at a fraction of the cost that we would do in South Africa so so that plant unfortunately still sits there to this day and hopefully one day it might get used um, we, 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 those of us on the project, um, whenever I traveled there, we actually lived in this little town. I go back, sorry, to, to uh, go back to this map. Um, we lived in the little town of Mindpur. Um, yeah, here, here, there, you can see where the blue circle is Mindpur, a little village. There was a, a bigger town, it's not showing on this to, to the left here again, called Raipur, which was sort of the, in fact, I think that became the capital of Ch Chhattisgarh. Anyway, we lived in the village and it was a wonderful experience. The people couldn't be nicer. Um, you can see they still use oxen to cart stuff from the fields or, or to pump water. And and we, we had um, wonderful, Indian food, the, the spices and the and the cooking was really exceptional. Um, the project also went ahead and built housing for the local people. Um, the the principal, the Indian diamantier, who who effectively sponsored this project, was quite positive that it would go ahead. Part of the deal was that you know you built some infrastructure for the people that we were either using in the field or in the laboratory. We trained um, young lab assistants, picture here on the right hand side, and those young girls picked up um, the expertise or, or the, the sort of processes needed in no time. Um, very, very industrious, hardworking and smart and, and all, all well educated. So it was a really fun project to be in and staying here living in the village was, as I say, fascinating. So, so that's, that's a bit of, of the country um, out in India. Working out there was was a lot of fun and I'm gonna keep going given time. Um, it, it, we, we, we walked a lot in, in the fields um, and in the countryside. Um, it was always fascinating um, to encounter um, people, these rural people uh, living in the small villages. All of those schools had a, all of those little villages had a school the kids um, back then, it was mostly um, the the the, um, the male child uh, children who would be educated. Not long after, which they changed the law in India. Most people will know that you know girls were almost not educated, but anyway, that changed, and girls now also get a decent education. But but we 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 would walk through a village, and you'd always encounter the school, and the headmaster would come out and see you, and then some of the kids would follow. When they heard you had a South African accent, they typically um, would would um, start talking crickets. And at that time, people like John T. Rhodes and Dante Cornier were still, <clears throat> excuse me, in our mix of cricket. And so you would spend the next half hour or so talking to these kids on the headmaster about cricket, and then you'd carry on walking, and you'd find the parents working in rice paddy fields or or sort of tendering crops. Okay, let's go from there um, back to back to Mumbai. So this is Mumbai, big West Coast city, um, 21 million people and growing. It's, as I said, the economic and business center of the country. And of course, many of you know or not know that it's the heart of the Bollywood film industry. And I'm sure some of you will have watched some of these films. Taj Mahal Hotel, we were quite privileged 
Anchorage, when we arrived in, in India and Mumbai, we would typically stay there for a night or two, meet the principal, um, Bharat Shah, who, who had a diamond business and factory in Mumbai. The amenities and the swimming pool were, were first class. Um, and in fact, when we went to, Marilyn and I went to the wedding, we also stayed in this hotel. So this, this is the capital of the international diamond industry. As I said, about 92% of the world's rough diamonds are bought, cut and polished and resold by Indian family businesses. Quite fascinating, COVID-19 shut down India in late March 2020, it effectively collapsed the world diamond business where suddenly people couldn't travel. The one thing that the Indian diamantes do, and, and they, they make a great effort, they like to see the diamonds they buy. I'm talking rough diamonds, not cut and polished. So they, for example, um, I guess have driven, some of you will have heard about, have heard about the, um, the site system. So if Botswana, Botswana sells diamonds at 10 sites per annum, um, they mine last year about 35 million carats of diamonds. They're the world's second biggest producer after Russia. And, and at those 10 sites, they would, at those 10 sales events or sites, um, the Indian diamantes who buy those goods will always make a point of going to see firsthand, you know, what they are buying. Typically, they will know that they get a certain assortment. Some of them buy bigger goods. Some of them buy the very small, tiny goods, the melee. But the 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 the, the um the process of for the site holders and all of these people that travel to see these sites is sort of a key part of the business. So shock horror when COVID came along and the whole world shut down, including India in March, um, what, 2021? No, oh, sorry, um, 2020, um, the, the diamond business almost collapsed. Credit to, to the Indian diamantes and all the big producers like Botswana and Russia. Um, they, they kept diamonds sort of in their vaults for several months. And then, and very interestingly, we also saw a lot of... Um, technology platforms coming to the fore to actually allow parcels of rough diamond to be to be sold from a distance. That's for another discussion, but COVID actually did the, the diamond market some good as well. Anyway, the business did recover. Um, this business going back 2000 years has outlasted a recession, world recession, two world wars, the global financial crash and of course now COVID. So it's proved to be very resilient over that 2000 years of, of activity. Um, we, we saw a big kick up in prices and activity um, in, in the middle of, or sort of from the middle of 2021. Diamond prices in the first half of, of last year were also very strong. And then they, they sort of flattened off um, in the latter part of last year, and they're a bit flat now as we speak, but they'll pick up again. This is a, a, a typical diamond factory. These are, are polishing wheels where diamonds are being um, polished and, and finished. Uh, this is the sort of very traditional approach, and you'll find this in, in many of these large buildings in Mumbai and, and up in Surat further to the Northwest. So as I said, India dominates the, the, the rough market and then cuts and polishes those diamonds. So the, the, the polished market they dominate is 60% share by value, 80% by volume, and 92% by quality of stone. So every eight out of 10 polished stones um, will be polished to an exceptional quality. The, these people take immense pride in, in the work that they do, and you're seeing more and more women in it as well. And as I said early on, primarily Jainus um, and, and dominantly um, family, family businesses. Um, the big trend um, in, in diamonds has been, again, technology. Cutting and polishing today is being driven by technology um, with increased um, efficiency, um, lower holding costs, typically cutting and polishing diamonds, the traditional way takes time. Um, the diamond gets cut, it gets inspected, it goes through a pipeline of checks and balances and um, certification, which is quite slow. Nowadays, 
Um, and this is just a very quick, quick rundown. There, there's some wonderful um, technology, Serene, being developed by, by the Indians. It's effectively image analysis um, studies of a diamond. It's, it's not much different to a CAT scan. So you stick a diamond into a image analysis. It's a very sophisticated microscope. I'm sure some of you that teach geology will know what I'm talking about. And you, you, and and they can do it for small stones, but it works obviously best in bigger stones, sort of you know two carats and bigger. So you 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 analyze that diamond, and you can you can map out every single glit or spot or imperfection, or or black inclusion in that diamond in three D space, and you record that in a database. Then the program, the program is called Galaxy. Um, will process this data and tell you how many, um, you know, super clean stones or partly clean stones you can cut out of that single diamond. And in this case, on the right hand side, you'll see these different colors, the red and the green and the blue, which are um, a model showing how many, you know, maybe one carat or two carat stones you can cut out of that one single stone. From, from there, if you're happy, um, or you might decide to, you know, take it a step further and only cut, if, if it's a sort of D flawless diamond, you want the top quality stone, you'll sort of take that a step further and only cut out the exceptionally clean, no inclusion, DIF, um, top color D, internally flawless diamond, whatever you choose. Um, from, from here, that diamond will go across to the left-hand side of the diagram into these laser cutter systems. Um, and then the technology or, or the, the mapping that you've done of, of that diamond on the right-hand side in, in the Serene and Galaxy process will be um, taken over to the, the laser cutter. And that laser cutter will cut the diamond almost to perfection. Um, there might still be some final polishing on the lap by a master craftsman, but these gents sitting here at these um, blue vacuum chambers are, are effectively managing the laser cutting process. And the gentlemen behind here at the bench are actually then inspecting the quality of the laser cuts and deciding how the finishing will be done. So technology has played a huge role in, in the development of this industry. And very interestingly, in the, in the Indian culture, um, you know, many of these young people, or not so young people, will actually start learning their business as kids. So you know, there's this big argument in the world about child labor. So if you go to an Indian factory, particularly in Surat, you may well see kids, um, you know, young people, not, not children, but kids uh, probably junior school level, you know, running around the factory and doing something in the factory. They'll go to school in the morning and the afternoon they'll work in the factory, their parents' factory. So they they start life very early on having a trade. Not all of them end up staying there, but you know, they by the time those guys or young people have finished their training, you know, they'll that they'll be going straight into a job. So they will have a job, whether they stay there or whatever is is obviously their choice. So it, it really is a model that works well. And with the advance of, of technology, um, and I'm nearly finished, with the advance of technology, these people just keep moving up the chain. They don't get put on the street. There's always a use for them in the next stage of the business. One very important comparison down here is the cost of manufacturing. To cut a, a, a one carat quality stone in India to a top cut is $10 a carat. In Belgium, because of labor costs, 70. In South Africa, it's about $120 a carat to cut the same diamond. And it just shows the efficiency and the, you know, the um, artisanship and the labor costs um, that you have in India. And for many people like South Africa, when it comes to beneficiation, you can't compete. And that's why India dominates the market. Okay, let's move on to India and go and look at the, the, the fun part. So you stay in a fancy hotel there, and this is where your laundry goes. So just take note to when you go, when you go to the local laundromat, this is it. So this is the express laundry, super fast, and it's Gansai Yam does um, 
laundry system and take note of the, the modernization, unlike the diamond business. This gent on the right is, um, you know, washing your sheets and he's giving them a good pound with his feet and taking great pride in how he does it. Okay, this is um, fresh food delivery, and this happened long before Uber Eats. Um, super efficient service with pride and precision. There's no maps, GPS, smartphones, laptops, and computers. So these are the double wallers, and it's, an, it's a sight to behold. So you go off to work in the morning with your briefcase, early morning, your cooked meal arrives. If you want it there at one o'clock or two o'clock in your office, it'll get there regardless um, and kept hot in these um, in these sort of insulated tins. It, it really, as I say, is a sight to behold. Transport and travel in India, again, another experience. And, and this just shows um, some sites around Mumbai. And 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 with with the development and the um, growth of their middle class, um, the number of cars on the roads in India is becoming astronomical. You can see the numbers there for yourself. And um, part of the reason why they've also embarked on a big um, highway development system scheme as well across India, but just too many people. And all these little yellow roofs and cars you see how either the tuk tuks or or the taxi. Other transport means, you still see this in India, where well, we certainly back um, did back then. These elephants were um, taking people between towns um, on the road to Jaipur. Um, out in the field, we used the tuk-tuk. You'd get to the end of a traverse, you wouldn't feel like walking back to your starting point. And so you'd commandeer a local tuk-tuk and um, get a lift back to, to either home base or, or the village you were staying in. And you see camels quite regularly, um, maybe less so today, up in, in the sort of drier northwest parts of India. This was the wedding. We won't bore you with too much, but we we went to a, a, a wonderful wedding um, of the marriage of, of uh, the Parit family. Their, I think it was their daughter. Um, a big diamante business, very successful offices in Mumbai, at, sorry, in Mumbai, obviously a factory, um, office in Dubai, and a big setup in, in Antwerp to, to the one of the Mittel families. Now, the Mittels, you'll know, are, are very famous in the iron and steel business. Anyway, it's a week-long affair, several ceremonies. We attended the last five days. We had um, been requested to send the sizes or our measurements. And when we got to, to Mumbai before the wedding, the, our clothes were all neatly made out, different clothes of different events um, in the hotel room for us. Okay, so, so there's yours truly and Marilyn um, going to the different fu um, functions that we went to. Um, this was the henna party. This was the bride and the groom and the groom's mother, lovely people. Marilyn will tell you at this ceremony, I think there were several hundred people. These guys had all been obviously well briefed and they came across to us and said, you know, good morning or good evening, um, Dr. and Mrs. Brister, how are you? So really, the, the Indians really go, go about, I guess it goes with their business culture and looking after their partners and service with a smile. So this is Marilyn being decorated in the henna party. And then this was the final wedding ceremony. This was at the Royal Western India Turf Club in Mumbai, quite a place. Um, it has a history spanning two centuries. Um, like cricket, horse racing is a legacy of the British Raj. So, so that's where we ended up for the final final um, supper and, and celebration, and they really laid it on. This was the, the tables, notice the um, King Proteas, South African Proteas down the middle. Um, we had bands and recitals all evening long, and it really was a, a, a wonderful experience. Weddings of the difference, just to show you, um, you know, the extent to the, which Indian people go, this was um, the marriage of Vishit Vanisha, Mittal, daughter of India's then second richest man, Lakshmi Mittal. I think some of you will have heard of him. It was in France. The cost was $60 million. A thousand guests were flown to France from all over the world. And just um, compare that to the poor royals who only spent $48 million 
um, back in the days of Charles and, and Diana when they got married, which is about, I guess, 110 million today, today's money. Just, just the last slide, I, I think, again, um, many of you have read um, um, the history of India. Um, it, it, there's some fascinating books, if anyone's interested, and happy to pass them on. The End of the British Raj, 1848 to 1947, The Partition. It was a very traumatic um, um, period of history in, in Indian history, where effectively, you know, people that had lived together for centuries were now sort of pushed apart or forced apart. And you had the Indians um, left in India, and you had um, the, the Pakistanis sort of pushed over into Pakistan. And, and the consequences of, of that, I guess, still sort of reverberate today as well. Um, and so that's just a bit of that um, that history. Um, there's some very good books, as I say, and we're happy to pass them on. And then just to end, this is my my take on India. Um, you know, just just the experience that true many of life, living color, vibrancy, class, and and caste, being poor, poverty, and it carries on. But the one fascinating thing that I found in India, wherever you went, um, you might get sort of overwhelmed by people numbers, but you never felt um, threatened. And, and very interestingly, in the Hindu religion and culture, um, in, uh, in poor people or caste people, not that, not that they sort of really have a say anyway, um, will respect what you have. Um, so, you know, if you're rich and some, you know, especially these diamantes are super rich, or people like us, white skins, privileged. When you walked around, they would be fascinating by you, particularly if you were white. Maryland, you know, was stopped at the um, in, um, um, at the um, at a gra and asked um, to have a photo taken with Indian people because she was white and she had a very colourful dress on. But um, and I I walked occasionally between hotels at night. Um, the street kids who sleep on the islands and the road would sort of come and you know look at you again because you were a bit different, but you never at any stage be felt threatened. And I walked in some of the slums normally with someone, but um, at no stage you know did you feel that your life was in danger or someone was going to throw a rock at you or, or, or cause you harm. Um, so 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 that's really it. Um, Gandhi, of course, famous character. He 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 was here in South Africa for quite a long period. I've always found his seven deadly sins quite fascinating, particularly his comment, and I think it sums up politicians very well, politics without principle. And I think sadly today that's what so many of our politicians um um, don't follow, um, and then you know, never forget. And Einstein noted that, that if it weren't for the Indians, we wouldn't have maps. So, so that's my my take on India. Um, as I say, been very fortunate. Happy to share more of this. You're welcome to the presentation, and lots of interesting books I can pass pass or pass on to you or or refer you to. Thank you. And those are just acknowledgements and some quite interesting YouTubes and on, on the history of India and on cutting and polishing diamonds. Thanks very much. Okay, back to you, Gillian. Sorry, it was a bit long. Oh, thank you very much for that wonderful talk, um, John. That was uh, truly fascinating. It takes a lot to uh, sit uh, riveted for um, almost an hour and a half <laughs> without uh, drifting off, but uh, you certainly have that. that for me. Um, Gordon, would you like to take over from here? Or, or I see John McNulty has uh, managed to right? battle yeah, his way through the, uh, the horrendous... Uh, um, storms. So, uh, John, perhaps you would like to, John, John uh, McNulty, would you like to take the questions? Uh, right. Sorry, I've just, uh, as you say, I've, sorry, I'm late joining. I've been on on on, no on route now. Um, thank you, John. That, that was that was amazing. Actually, I've never been to India, but I have to say, I um, I was intrigued by the comments at the end about you know you 
uh, what you what you wouldn't understand until you travel there. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I I'll invite questions on the chat function if anybody wants to ask any questions there and uh, field them to John. But thank you very much. Um, there was a lot in that, and it's very interesting for us because we had a lecture in this series. We've had a lecture, obviously, on 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 diamonds specifically, which which so it's very interesting to have the background to that in in looking again at uh, at, at the aspect in India as well. Okay, you haven't lived if you haven't been to India, so make make a make a plan. And there's some fascinating lips there as well, as you know, um, Gillian. <clears throat> I think it's one for definitely one for my bucket list, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Right. Anybody? Any questions? I um, I, I um, just if anybody wants to feel their questions on the chat function, if you understand how that works, yeah. I'll just keep a, a minute to, to see if anybody's got any questions there. Um, well, while people are um, formulating their questions, maybe I could kick off by asking John to say something about the relationship of De Beers and uh, the Indian diamond industry yeah yeah so you know the diamond industry is fascinating um you know it used to be dominated by the beers um and um it's it's been uh, you know and and i guess in the early days one of the big problems in the industry Gillian, was the lack of transparency and they you know, De Beers were very much at fault. I mean, they they um, at that you know in the in the sixties and seventies and eighties, they controlled most of the world's production, particularly gemstones. Um, even then, the the diamonds um, were mostly cut and polished in India, um, and not much you know not many people knew much about it. Anyway, the Canadian deposits um, that were discovered in '91 made a big difference to that because, as you know, the Canadians and their junior companies, when they find a diamond, they want to move the share price. So suddenly, the world changed for diamonds, and and transparency became a big thing. But over the years, um, um, in, um, De Beers did also culture you know strong ties with the Indians. In fact, when we flew, Marilyn and I flew to excuse me, to India in 2005, Nikki and Strilly Oppenheimer were sitting in the front of the plane. Um, so, you know, that was, that they knew all the big diamantes and they were, you know, part of part of the Indian family, so to speak. Um, and, and um, you know, I think the, the realization for De Beers is that um, India um, was was a, a key partner, in fact, you know, and and a big risk as COVID showed when the when um, you know when India shut down, the market shut down. But but the the other big turning point was also fascinatingly when the Argyle diamond mine was discovered um, by the Australians, ironically, or Australian prospecting group, a small company. There was a lady, Maureen Muggeridge, who drove that process, lovely girl. Um, they found the Argyle deposit in the Kimberley block up in the northwest in 1981, much to the shock and horror of De Beers. You know, we we knew it all and, and no one was ever going to find a, a big diamond mine anywhere else. Anyway, that diamond mine produced um, 40 million carats, as I said, in, in its peak production by 1990. Um, the world production at that time was 160 million carats of rough diamonds. So they produced 25%. Those, those goods looked like road metal. They average, and I'm sorry I'm laboring the point, but it just goes to show what could be done. Those diamonds were worth what we talk about run of mine. As you all know, there's no price today in the marketplace for a rough diamond. Each diamond is different. Those diamonds, they run, the run of mine production, as we call it, average $9 a carat. It was absolute junk. But then there, there were some gorgeous pink stones. And, and if any of you, you know, have money to invest in, in diamonds for a future date or for a girlfriend or fiance or wife, you know, buy the, buy the colored stones, the real colored stones. So, so today, um, the pinks, cut and polished pinks and reds out of Argyle are selling at like two and three million dollars per carat. They are just exceptional. So it's 0.2 of a gram. Anyway, so when that miner came, when that mine was discovered and this absolute junk, um, it took to beers and the Indian cutters and polishers 
and Argyle Diamonds, the name of the company then, um, they got their heads together because immediately the big concern is that large production would flood the market. And, and it was really due to that sort of tripartite um, group of people who put their heads together. And it was largely due to these um, cutting families, cutting and polishing families in Surat. Um, and back then it was all done, you know, by hand and wheel and, and a hand lens or a, a microscope. Um, the Surat cutters and polishers and, and family businesses were able to take um, the very poor quality <clears throat> goods that came out of Argyle and they would cut, they would cut a one pointer or a two pointer. And they, back then they, they put, um, you know, most diamonds today have 32 facets on them. They would put slightly fewer facets. I think it was 24, but they would cut that diamond, at, 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 you know, it might be a one point, it might be a two point or five point of these incredibly small diamonds. And, um, and then they, they got set in jewelry. So, so back in, in the late eighties and the early nineties, you could buy a diamond pendant, a set of earrings and a ring for $20. In the States, it was $1990. And suddenly you could afford a piece of diamond jewelry. And it's been fascinating if you could go back and look at the history of that period and the marketing, and that's where De Beers came in. They started marketing, you know, counter to sort of their normal business, these cheap, cheap diamond jewelry for $20 a shot. And suddenly, particularly in the States, you know, millions of people could afford a diamond that they would have not normally been able to afford. But as, as those people went up the curve, um, you know, particularly the baby boomers and the people who, who, um, who um, you know, got wealthier and paid for their house and got rid of the mortgage, you know, they started to then buy real bigger diamonds. So, so it became a very important part of, you know, the diamond business. Um, so you could go from starting a cheap, buying a cheap diamond later on in life, you, you know, with eternity rings and that you could afford a bigger one. So, so there, I think De Beers and um, the Indians really became a lot closer and, and man, they did an amazing job selling all those goods and, you know, the, di the diamond industries ne never looked back. And to finish, we're seeing the same thing today with synthetic diamonds. So, so nowadays we can, well, you can make diamonds very easily, not difficult. You just emulate what goes on in the mantle, heat and pressure. So you can make synthetic diamonds, you grow them in wafers, and then you cut and polish whatever you want out of it. So, so that's also becoming a big business. And again, to me, it's positive for the market. It's, it's brandable. It's the sort of stuff young people are buying. Chinese love it. And again, you'll see that same trend of then buying up value as you, you know, grow wealth in your future. Uh, right. Thanks. Question. I mean, I, moving on to, uh, to, to it's interesting because you mentioned about the about the um, the supply there, obviously with synthetic diamonds, well, because Gordon Little, who's a member, is asking, um, is there any evidence of a decline in the diamond resource? Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we have a problem, so to speak, in natural diamonds. So last year. Last year, um, in last year in COVID in twenty twenty one, production was one hundred and seventeen million carats of rough. Last year, it was a pick, kicked up about one hundred and thirty, down from that peak of of one hundred and sixty, and we and we haven't seen you know a new world class diamond mine discovery since nineteen ninety one, the Canadian discoveries. So you're absolutely right. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern, and I'm, of course, a traditionalist, you know, we've got to find some more natural diamonds, so we need a big world-class mine, um, but, you know, it costs a lot of money, you, it really is a needle in a haystack type business, and, uh, well, and we uh, haven't uh, seen, carry are on. People, so, so are people, you know, searching for these, uh, these, these extra resources, I mean, is that something that De Beers or who, whoever you know, invests in or the, uh, with the help of geologists? Well, it, you know, even De Beers for the last um, 10, 15 years haven't done much exploration. BHP went away. They no longer do diamonds. Rio Tinto, interestingly, is back in the business. And we we do see, you know, quite a, long, uh, quite a number of, of junior players. 
But encouragingly, last year, we saw De Beers and Rio Tinto go back into Angola. Angola, we think, is still very prospective. Um, a lot of it's covered by sand. Um, we're seeing more activity in Botswana. Um, Canada has probably been flogged to death. Um, you know, they, they've had, and they've mined a lot of uh, very rich, small kimberlites, but um, those those kimberlites, you know, three to five hectares or at the end of their lives. And um, what, one of the key things um, is that Botswana, Botswana has the world's richest diamond mine. It's called Joining in southern Botswana. It's um, at surface, it was about 54, you know, that's um, premier. It was about um, 70 hectares. And then um, the Arapa diamond mine, when they found it, was 110 hectares. It's just a massive ore body. So those two mines will go for a long time yet, although, you know, um, John Eng is, is has to go underground in the next few years, and that sort of doubles your costs and, and mm -hmm. halves your production. Yeah. Um, I have another question from Anne Watkins, who is asking, uh, the Deccan Volcanics terminated diamonds. Um, could you say how? Did they just cover the Kimberlite pipes? Uh, no, the, 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 well, it, it's very interesting. Um, it, India is fascinating, and it's something we, we started to discuss with Gillian. Um, the, the known most of the known kimberlites that have some diamonds, and we're pretty confident that it's those kimberlites that produced the, the big diamonds in the Krishna River are typically twelve hundred million years old. So they mm -hmm. they're much older than the Dakar, um, but they you know they, they and those diamonds were brought to surface a long time ago, and then they were spread down the big rivers and. A lot of that Dakar plateau 65 million years ago has obviously now been weathered off by, you know, modern weathering, and and it may have previously covered some of those kimberlites, but you know most of them are exposed. Um, but but if you look at um, and and that's a discussion for us to have with Julian and Bruce, and that it, we, we we think that the skating process whereby you know India took off at a that um, like a, a, a Ferrari motor car across the Indian Ocean might have delaminated that um, cratonic keel. Because many of these old cratons, the way we look at cratons, they have a, a very stable um, keel locked on the bottom of what we call, you know, depleted lithosphere. And that's why probably the lips have a, a role to play because that extraction of basalt leaves behind a depleted um, Peritotegic lithosphere, and that's where the diamonds get formed and preserved. I mean, we've been able to date diamonds with modern technology, you know, looking at the inclusions in diamonds back to 3.2 billion years. So they've been mm -hmm. locked in a, it, it's like an iceberg. And, you know, that's how yeah. we geologists look at it the lithospheric keel. And it's a very stable, coherent um, part of the mantle or upper mantle, and it relocates or, or translates across you know, when the continents wander around with that continent. So we think there was a diamondiferous keel under India back in, you know, the Protozoic 1200 million years, but we also know the young kimberlites there, and we haven't seen a lot of diamonds in those young kimberlites. Um, and we see it again on the Wyoming Craton, for example. The Wyoming Craton has kimberlites, it has some kimberlites on the eastern edge state line with diamonds. But um, the Kimberlites in the Wyoming Craton don't have any diamonds. And, and again, I think there's enough evidence, heat flow in that, that suggests that the original keel, the Archean keel under Wyoming Craton has also, you know, been eroded away. But it's a very interesting topic you raised. Oh, well, interesting. I was going to say, that, that's Anne Watkins, a member who's, who's, who's placed that question. There's a question now from Liz Kersop. Saying sounds like corruption and bureaucracy are big obstacles to Indian gem mining. Does it also affect the trading of finished gems? Um, it, it's um, the bureaucracy clearly um, slowed down or stopped um, mining in the field, and um, I, I think it's a good question. Again, part of that problem is that um, you know the Indians being traders, um, they. 
they're very good at doing a turn now. I mean, they'll cut and polish a diamond and sell it in two months' time, you know, for a for a buck or or a hundred bucks, depending on the price. Um, that they they don't have a long term view what you need to be if you're an explorer and a diamond miner. You know, our the diamond industry in this country has been ongoing for 150 years, and it takes a lot of capital investment. A lot of time and patience. It's um, it's not something that's sort of um, typical of the Indian culture. You know, they traders. They 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 make a buck, um, you know, in a day or a couple of days. And and so, explaining to an Indian bureaucrat that if I'm going to you know invest and develop and build a diamond mine, it's going to take me you know years, not um, not weeks and months. And it's the yeah. same problem, as I said, Rio Tinto found a really nice, actually, lamp rides, group of lamp rides called the Bunda Pipes, um, quite close to Panel. Um, but man, you know, they eventually walked away and those pipes are still sitting there. Gosh. Um, I have another question, so I'm going to invite uh, um, B. Williamson to unmute themselves and ask the question. Oh, hi, good day. Thank, thanks a lot, John. Um, my limited knowledge of, of I guess, um, as diamond operations more in our neck of the woods is the actual physical security of diamonds is a big, big issue. Yeah. Um, just looking at some of those cutting centers, et cetera, and you describing the people, I mean, what, what sort of security is needed around that vast amount of diamonds passing through there? No, Bruce, it's a good question. I mean, you know, they, uh, I mean, I, I think the Indians, though, you know, those ordinary people, um, and as I said, in, 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 in the Hindu sort of um, culture, you know, theft, as I said, um, if you walk down the street there, no one ever came over, you know, and stole your purse or wallet. And I think that culture runs through, through that society. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, um, and and they, you know, they, there's there's a lot of CCTV cameras. Um, every parcel that's handed out in the morning or the off or put away in the afternoon, you know, is is weighed um, and 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 reconciled. So you know, the checks and balances are are pretty um, pretty um, tough. And um, you know, man, I mean, that, you know, those guys. When when you spend your life looking at a diamond, you know, you and I would look at a parcel and say, "Well, that's all the same." You know, the experts um, that they obviously not in the little stones, Bruce, but if it's a bigger stone where the value would lie, I, I mean, to to steal those, you know, fine chips, you've got to almost steal you know, a suitcase of them to achieve much value. Yeah, the value yeah, really yeah. comes when you set it in in, in jewellery or in pave or somewhere. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, when it gets to bigger stones, you know, those those diamantiers know their diamonds, man. If they, if they think there's a stone missing from a parcel that they've inspected or has been cut and polished, they pick it up very quickly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just another one. Can you remind us uh, sort of more recent numbers? What what sort of level of carrots uh, and and by value are actually bought and w within India itself? So what sort of percentage of the demand do they account for? Well, Bruce, they, they don't really produce anything. So, so... No, in terms of consumption, in terms of physically uh, buying. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, only now, more recently, probably in the last 10 years, are Indians starting to also wear diamond as adornment. You know, it's very interesting. Their, 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 um, you know, their wedding processes, it was always about having gold jewelry. And man, you know, you go to an Indian wedding, and I don't think I pointed it out, but, you know, the young girl that got married in the in the wedding we went to, you know the gold jewelry and gold adornment was was fantastic, but um, even though they were a diamond fact um, family, you know you didn't. There were some, but you didn't see a lot of diamonds, and mm -hmm. and um, you know that that's that was traditional. Precious stones are are much more common. You you know you'll see women wearing gold with precious um, stones, but. Um, as I say, it's only really probably in the last 10, 15 years. Um, 
and and remember, I think it was when we were there working there in, in the 2000s. I mean, at one stage, advertising was not allowed in India. You, you know, you never got billboards advertising diamonds. The gold jewelry was a traditional thing, but but it has changed, Bruce. And you know, you do see, particularly at uh, you know upmarket weddings, more and more people also wearing diamond jewelry. But that market is still small. Um, you know, the world's biggest market for re retail diamond jewelry, as you know, is is India, uh, sorry, I mean, the, the US and then China. And then, you know, probably countries in, in the UAE. So India okay. from a, from a, from a <laughs> you know, buying and, and buying and wearing in, um, diamond jewelry is still quite small, but I'd, I'll get the figures for you. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, it's, it's approaching what, quarter past nine, so I think uh, I think it's probably time to say thank you very much indeed for a, a, oh, a, an illuminating an illuminating discussion about uh, well uh, about the diamond industry, but actually about India along the way. There's a lot of history yeah. in there, and it reminds yeah, amazing me. History. A personal note: yeah. I need to go and read up on it. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to speak to us. I don't know whether Julian, who I know has in, arranged the invitation, wants to say a final word. Well, just to uh, reiterate what uh, John McNulty just said, and thank you very much indeed, John. That was uh, extremely enjoyable. Thank you very much. Okay.